Hi everyone! In this video, I want to talk about the North and the South Node of the Moon. First, from an astronomical perspective, what they are, how they are formed, and so on. And then I'll talk about their astrological significance. In light of the upcoming eclipses that will occur on April 20th, with a total solar eclipse, and then two weeks later, on May 5th, with a penumbral lunar eclipse. Astrology is deriving meaning from astronomical phenomena, and the north and the south node of the moon, in Vedic astrology referred to as Rahu and Ketu, are such important points to examine, because they represent, they symbolize the path of our consciousness, the path that our consciousness is moving along to evolve. So let's dive in. This represents the orbital plane of the moon, the path of the moon going around the earth, which is one revolution per month, or about every 27.32 days. And this depicts the ecliptic, geocentrically speaking, so looking at it from earth, is the apparent path that the sun makes around the earth over the course of a year. Of course, we know that the Earth revolves around the Sun, but it's a different perspective that is still used in spherical or positional astronomy and for astrological purposes. Now, the ecliptic has a North and a South Pole, which is the North Ecliptic Pole and the South Ecliptic Pole. And the Moon spends half of its time in the Northern Ecliptic Hemisphere and half of its time in the southern ecliptic hemisphere. And on its trajectory, it crosses the ecliptic twice. It's able to cross it or intersect it because the orbital plane of the moon is at a five degree angle with respect to the ecliptic. So these orbits exist in different planes. Now, whenever the moon travels from the northern ecliptic hemisphere to the southern ecliptic hemisphere, and crosses the ecliptic, this is where the descending node, or the south node, or in Vedic astrology referred to as Ketu, is being formed. And whenever the moon travels from the southern ecliptic hemisphere to the northern ecliptic hemisphere and crosses the ecliptic, this is where the ascending node, or the north node, or Rahu, is being formed. The ascending and descending node form a line, which is what is referred to as the line of nodes. It is along this line that eclipses occur. So where the moon's orbit around the Earth intersects with the ecliptic is where the line of nodes is drawn. And that's why the ecliptic is called the ecliptic, because it's on the apparent path of the sun going around the Earth that the eclipses occur when the moon lands along that path. Eclipses can only happen at full moon and new moon. This is when the sun, the earth and the moon are all in a straight line or near straight line, which is called Sezigi. The reason why they don't happen every full moon and every new moon is due to the fact that the orbit of the moon is tilted relative to the ecliptic plane as I've mentioned before. So the Earth and the Moon both go around the Sun, and the tilt of the orbital plane of the Moon changes direction relative to the Sun. So the angle makes that the Moon often passes below or above the Earth. And at these times, the Moon doesn't cross the line between the Sun and the Earth. We know that the tilt of the Earth, which is 23 and a half degrees, causes the seasons, right? So that's why summer and winter happen every six months. Similarly, eclipses also tend to occur about every six months. Every calendar year has a minimum of four eclipses, sometimes five, sometimes six, and even sometimes seven. And this is because the plane of the moon 
keeps about the same direction in space. Now let's talk a bit about solar eclipses. What happens during a solar eclipse is that the new moon moves between the sun and the earth, blocking the rays of the sun and casting a shadow on parts of the earth. Parts of the earth because the moon's shadow is not big enough to cover the whole entire planet. As a result of the movement of the earth around its axis and its movement around the sun and then the moon going around the earth, the course of the eclipse changes and it looks like the eclipse is traveling. The complete shadow of the moon onto the earth is 270 kilometers wide. The moon has an elliptical orbit. So depending on where it is during the year, the distance from Earth changes. So during a solar eclipse, when the moon is at its farthest distance from Earth, which is referred to as apogee, it appears to be smaller. And during the solar eclipse leaves a ring of fire, which is what we call an annular solar eclipse. This comes from the Latin word annulus, which means ring. This is when the moon covers the center of the sun and at its maximum darkest point during the eclipse, it leaves a ring of fire. It's interesting because it is the only time that we can actually see the new moon silhouetted against the sun. Any other new moon, we can't see the moon as she is not being illuminated by the sun. And at these times, she is blended in with the dark night sky, which makes her completely invisible. A lunar eclipse only happens during a full moon, when the Earth casts a shadow on the moon. So when the Earth lies exactly between the sun and the moon, and the moon lies in the shadow of the Earth, is when a lunar eclipse occurs. This is what we call a blood moon because of the sunlight that passes through the atmosphere of the Earth. Eclipses are the most dramatic celestial events we can see with the naked eye. And they always come in pairs. Well, rarely they come in trios. So either we have a solar eclipse first, and then two weeks later a lunar eclipse, or vice versa. The foundation of astrology is deriving meaning from astronomical phenomena. To the naked eye, eclipses appear to be the most dramatic celestial events. Therefore, observing eclipses has led astrologers to bestow upon the lunar nodes such meanings as radical, extreme, destabilizing, and transformative. Every morning, the sun rises over the eastern horizon, giving birth to a new day. When a child is born, astrologers calculate the intersection between the eastern horizon and the ecliptic in order to determine the ascendant, aka rising sign or lagna. Although not a celestial body, the ascendant is a key point in the natal chart, revealing information about the person's body, physical appearance and the body's path. Similarly, Rahu is called North Node or Ascending Node because it rises over the ecliptic horizon as a result of the Moon's path crossing the path of the Sun. The two luminaries, Sun and Moon, are at the core of creating and interpreting astrological charts. Through the Moon, we experience ourselves subjectively with our needs, emotions, and inner knowing. The sun represents the light of consciousness, the essence of life, the utmost masculine archetype, which symbolically impregnates the utmost feminine archetype, the moon, thus conceiving Rahu, the individual consciousness. In the nodal axis, Rahu is the head, the upper part, where all the sense organs are situated. Rahu has a voracious appetite for life. It amplifies the needs, emotions, and longings of the moon. I like to call Rahu the moon's fantasy. 
The exaltation sign of the moon is Taurus, which is the face in astrological anatomy. So this is the area where the senses are experiencing the world. Hindu astrologers consider the nodes to be Caesars or Grahas, so they take whatever planet and sign and house they touch in the horoscope and embark on a journey. Interestingly enough, some Hindu astrologers consider Rahu to be very well placed in Taurus, perhaps because that is the moon's exaltation, and Rahu would amplify that sign of moon's exaltation. We talked so much about the North Node already, perhaps because of its seductive appeal and illusion-filled aura. But at the other end of the nodal axis there is Ketu, the South Node, the descending node of the Moon formed when the moon sets under the ecliptic horizon in a horoscope. So while Rahu is similar to the rising sign and the birth of something, Ketu is like the descendant, the seventh house, the setting of the sun and the death of something. While Rahu is the head, Ketu is the headless body, the internalizing of needs and knowingness, ancestral lineage and past lives, and death of individual consciousness. While Rahu is worldly and extroverted, Ketu is spiritual and introverted. However, if the individual fails to integrate the nodal lessons in their respective houses, signs and planets they touch, the axis becomes imbalance and chaos in a person's life. Through the extreme manifestation of the nodes as compulsion, addiction, and rigidity. In astrology, the North Node is the point in need of development, and the South Node is the security paradigm we fall back on. Rahu is the future, always moving forward, oftentimes compulsively. That's why it is also associated with technology, illusion, and artificial ways seeking to push the boundaries of human existence. K2 is the past, where we come from, past lives and ancestral lineage, where we retreat to as our comfort zone. But that comfort zone can also act as a limiting self-imposed prison, a dead end. So the extreme effects of K2 can lead to severe depression. K2 is where we eventually find liberation but only after having integrated the perilous journey of Rahu, a journey instigated by the trickster node that amplified the value of something opposite your comfort zone. Ages 42 and 48 are very important in a person's life as they mark the nodal maturations and oftentimes these years bear the trademark of chaotic, compulsive, but hopefully transformative to a person's life. Now let's look a little bit at the astrological chart for the total solar eclipse that will occur on April 20th, 2023. Here we can see that the sun and moon join in the tropical sign of Aries in the last degree. So we're going to have a new moon, and in this case, close to the north node or the ascending node or Rahu. So we're going to have a Rahu total solar eclipse. Now Rahu amplifies the needs of the moon. It points to the archetype of the trickster. It's symbolized by the head of the dragon, the dragon who's never satiated. It has a certain compulsion. 180 degrees apart is K2 or the descending node. Um, Rahu is a worldly planet. K2 is can be spiritual, but it wants to hide. You know, it's it has to do with inhibition and depression, um, going inward. I think that's a better way to say it. So Rahu is outwardly going. It's going up, right? It rises over, but so the moon rises over the ecliptic horizon, and then K2 is the descending node it goes under it's the death of something it's going inward and downward so these nodes are extremes and extremes are always difficult to balance so it's where we are vulnerable 
to negative conditioning. It's where we are vulnerable to becoming psychologically weak. And of course, we all have our weaknesses. And that's where the nodes are really working, right? That can be really tricky there. Now, the most significant aspect during this eclipse is the square to Pluto, right? The sun and the moon are applying to an exact square to Pluto. Pluto is here in the first degree of Aquarius. Well, the, the green line that you're seeing here is actually a Rashi aspect. Rashi means sign. It's a sign-based aspect. So it's the fixed sign is aspecting a cardinal sign. Um, except the cardinal sign next to it. But here we see an exact Rashi aspect of um, the eclipse to Pluto. Okay. Um, now, Pluto, of course, is the Greek god of the underworld. He kidnapped Persephone, the daughter of Zeus, and brought her to the underworld. So the underworld has to do with the afterlife, but also with facing our demons, um, our shadow. Whenever you have to face your shadow, you're going to the underworld. So Pluto often has a relationship connotation because of its mythology. And when I got married, Pluto was exactly to the degree on my seventh house cusp. And as it went through my relationship house, so through my seventh house, my relationship outlook or how I perceived relationships, how I related to people radically changed. So Pluto has an intense transformative quality. So it's square to the eclipse. Now, the, sol the sun is being eclipsed, right? The moon is going to block the rays of the sun. So what does the sun represent in astrology, right? It's symbolized by a circle with a dot or a point in the middle. So everything revolves around the sun. The sun symbolizes our identity, our core identity, our ideology, our individuality. The sun also represents our creative purpose, that eternal spark of creativity. So when Pluto is in a hard aspect to the sun, and in this case, you know, it's a square. Um, it shows tension and two forces need to cooperate, need to come to some kind of resolution, but it's an aspect of tension. It's, it's not flexible. It's not necessarily compatible, right? Here we see Pluto as a, you know, also associated with Shiva, the destroyer. It has intent. It's definitely an, an indicator of and Of intensity. course, the square also is associated with tension. So what we see here is that there can be an intensified emphasis to create and, and also to develop a special purpose. So creating a personal reality that reflects that special purpose. So this is all about learning to take control over one's own destiny and use strength of will. Pluto is the 12th planet and neurologically it relates to Mars, the third planet, who is all about exerting one's will right the sun is symbolized by a circle with the mars is also symbolized by a circle but it has this outward going arrow here so it executes the will of the king right to make the kingdom a better place so this aspect can reveal the limits of personal power so basically what can you do and what can't you do because your purpose your destiny itself has some limitation and that limitation is linked to the role that you are designed to play. So whenever the sun and Pluto are in aspect, there's this potential for renewal, regeneration, metamorphosis of the individual purpose of your creative purpose. This can be a very impactful transit. It's also important to remember that a Pluto-sun aspect promotes a compulsive need to eliminate anything that is in between you and your creative purpose or you and creating your personal destiny. When that is done in a healthy way, of course, that's good. But when people misuse or underuse power, these are the unhealthy expressions of a Pluto-Sun combination. That will only lead to frustration and ultimately a collapse. Now, Sun also represents government authority figures. Traditionally, it represents the father. So that could be interesting to watch on the collective uh, level um, with governments, uh, how this eclipse will play out. Now, we can also see that Mercury during the time of the eclipse is applying to a conjunction with Uranus. So Mercury represents our intellect, right? It's the bridge between the outer 
world and the inner world or the mental mind. It's actually the exchange between the two. See, the moon represents our emotions and our longings, but Mercury comes after. Mercury represents our capacity for discernment and analysis, our capacity for language, communication, and we can extrapolate that to uh, like Mercury friends. is a natural indicator of friends and friendships and, and deals and creating balance. So whenever Mercury and Uranus conjunct, it promotes intellectual stimulants and there can also be upheaval, right? Uranus is the planet of shock and upheaval. It was discovered during a time um, when many revolutions happened. It was also discovered with a telescope, right? We didn't see it with the naked eye. Um, so it has to do with uh, technological uh, progress and so on. So this conjunction is about reformulating and transforming, expanding our fixed and rigid ideas. So we, And we need those intellectual shakeups. Now, our emotional security is strongly connected to an intense power of intellectual organization. So when people challenge our beliefs, it can be an uncomfortable thing. Now, Jupiter represents beliefs. Jupiter, in fact, creates a filter. And when what we are analyzing, what we are studying doesn't reflect the belief, then it will be rejected. But ultimately, it's a good thing because when we get challenged, we are forced to reconsider, rethink our opinions and our ideas. Now, there can also be intellectual breakthroughs with this aspect. Perhaps a new idea pops into your head. Some intellectual breakthrough. Um now, Uranus always brings in the new. It definitely can rapidly change things and facilitate growth. And sometimes the changes can go too rapidly that it can have a quite destabilizing effect. Um, now, it is the planet of shock, right? Um, development, revolt, rapid, rapid change. So in that sense, it can also break things because it brings in things sometimes a little too quickly. So that other things just have to go. In my personal horoscope, I'm always looking forward to uh, connections between Mercury and we can Uranus. also see that Jupiter is still quite close to the eclipse, right? It's within six, seven degrees. Jupiter is a benefic, the planet of wisdom. So I think it's not a bad thing to have Jupiter there. Um, and then Saturn is uh, trining the south node and sextiling the north node. So the eclipse is also applying to that. Saturn is the planet of our limitations and can be a separating Raha. Um, but through our limitations, we can reach our full potential. And here we see, you know, a trine as a harmonious aspect and a sextile. You know, we, when you look at the previous set of eclipses, we had Saturn involved uh, with the tight so whenever square. something needs to be let go of uh, in a square and, and Saturn involved uh, can um, be more um, discomforting, okay? Now, eclipses are significant symbolic marker points that indicate radical change it's not necessarily so much about the day of the eclipse, even though it can definitely play out like that, especially when you have planets in the last degrees of any of the cardinal or movable signs, or when you have planets in the first degrees of any of the fixed signs. You now, this eclipse can definitely be felt a lot more intensely uh, because of Pluto's aspect there. It can be a lot more personal, um, but it's, you know, it's, it's more about the, the time building up to the eclipse, right? To the, the main theme of it. And then also looking at the, the days and the weeks and the months after. Right? So these are important marker points. Okay, so thank you for watching and have a great week. Until next time. Bye.